All right, welcome back to The Point. Now, we found a really great tweet by Richard Branson. It's really interesting. Sir Richard Branson, um, he says, there are more black people in prison today for taking drugs than there were slaves in the U.S. when slavery was abolished, which is amazing. And that's literally true. Shira, what, what conclusions can we begin to draw from that? Well, I was just really impressed that he spoke out like that as someone who's, you know, um, such a prominent leader and in the mainstream space for him to make such what could be perceived as a controversial statement. Um, but it all comes down to um, he was involved in with Portugal and um, their, you know, anti-drug movement. And they, ch they changed it from the Department of Justice to the Department um, of Health. And they said this is a health issue. It's not a justice issue. Putting people behind bars isn't going to solve the problem. And it's something that we need to look at ourselves here, the issue we have here at home. I mean, the fact that there's more cocaine use here in the U.S. than marijuana in Portugal, I mean, there's crazy stats that came out of this case study. Yeah. And look, one of the things that Shira is referring to is that the drug use in Portugal has gone down fairly dramatically since they uh, basically stop prosecuting people who are taking drugs. 13 to 15 year olds fell from 14.1 percent to 10.6. 16 to 18 year olds 27.6 to 21.6. Meanwhile, it's not like, hey, well, they're in Europe, all the you know drug use is going down. No, yeah. the rest of Europe drug use is actually going up. Property crimes way down too, because right. what 50 to 80 percent in Branson's piece, he said, of all property crime is committed by drug users. Mm -hmm. So you eliminate the drug use. What also went up in that period of time was people seeking treatment. So all of a sudden you decriminalize it, and people who were addicted think it's okay to come forward and seek help because they're not going to be criminalized. Heroin use down, everything down. Rates of HIV infection through intravenous drug use down. I mean, nothing but great societal benefits. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, there's two aspects of this. One is a, a war on drugs, which I think is an abysmal failure. The other is how often African Americans are getting locked up for the war on drugs. 12% of the country, uh, but they make up 40.2% of all inmates in the system. Wow. Now, of course, look, our population has risen since the end of the Civil War, so we also have more blacks in the country, so that's why you all have... All of a sudden, slavery doesn't seem like such a big deal. I think everybody <laughs> should just pipe down about it. <laughs> right, and uh, so, you know, and obviously that's not what Branson's getting mm -hmm. at, but he's uh, getting at, you know, but visualizing a, that, I mean, right away, exactly, you get that there's the an issue, there's a problem. We spend right now $50 billion on the war on drugs here in the States. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself. See, we're spending on the military, on the war on drugs. There's a war on everything right now. Where could we be putting that money? So what it winds up being is the, uh, a war on a lot of us. So whether it's African Americans getting locked up in this country, and by the way, it's selective prosecution. Totally. That, you know, the amount of times that blacks are prosecuted for crimes that whites are not prosecuted for, especially in the drug arena, is a crime. It's or outrageous. Lohan. Right. How many times has she been prosecuted? I, yeah, right. And how many minutes has she spent in jail? And then... Uh, in Mexico, nearly 40,000 people have been killed in the war on drugs. Mm. And who, who's winning? Nobody's winning. I mean, Brian, is there anybody who thinks if we just wait a couple more years, we're going to win the war on drugs? Um, I don't think anyone thinks that. I mean, this argument makes me want to stab myself. I mean, because we've been arguing this same issue since we were kids in school, in debate class. And it's a circular argument that never, no one ever exerts any leadership on. And, uh, you know, look, this is one of those issues I believe that states need to decide for themselves how they want to prosecute criminals who use drugs or whether they are criminals at all. How they want to deal with their state's prison systems. California is broke. We spend nine billion dollars a year in California housing people. And yeah, a good percentage of those are drug offenders. But w when we rely on the federal government to dictate to us how we're going to spend money on fighting this war on drugs, it really takes away from states, basically, and to determine what they want to do on this issue. You know what's really interesting today is that everybody's taking different turns being Ron Paul, because that's exactly what Ron Paul says on the God war on drugs. Darn it. <laughs> okay, you but, stole my act. <laughs> <right? laughs> but, but he's right again. I mean, look, I would go much further. So let me throw that out there. I mean, not only would I uh, legalize marijuana and I do it across the nation? Yeah. I'd legalize every single drug, okay? Because you're never going to win that fight. It's prohibition. The minute you make it prohibition, you create gangs, you make it worse. Have the government sell it for cheap, and what happens in the Netherlands, in Portugal, is that drug use does not go up, it goes down. Because yeah, it's not you know cool what, to go into a government here, building and be like, okay, futility, give me my heroin. Here's the futility of relying on Portuguese statistics. It's like relying, <laughs> it's like taking, it's like the whole, the, you, 
you got. <laughs> what is it, man? Like, where's that? You, you, that was funny in and of itself. Like, you know, like, we should borrow the social security system from Costa Rica. I mean, it just doesn't have. You it will never resonate. convince Americans to borrow anything from any country other than something from England. Or Canada? Because that's where we get. Forget Canada. That's, a, that's even worse than the yeah, Portugal. Yeah, you guys gave us mad I mean, cow disease. Oh, yeah. 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 You're in Portugal. Is it, which is like, <laughs> so I think the national argument has no place anymore because we haven't solved the problem for decades. This war on drugs keeps going and going and going. I, I'm t I know it, it, it does sound Ron Polish. You know, you know, but now in LA, I mean, things have changed. There were places uh, popping up across the city, you know, green spots, green stores, and now they're cracking down on that. And so it's interesting to see every state now, you know, be changing how they approach. But I'll tell you what, this. since we've been doing medical marijuana in California, everybody has lost their minds. Uh, it turns out Reagan was right. Everybody's on drugs and like Everyone California is falling apart. So California then it was against what you're saying. Were legal, though. <laughs> What's that? I said everyone was already nuts in California <laughs> right. before pot, pot, pot was legal. And the thing is, though, so my biggest problem with this whole argument is we keep asking people to fix this issue that are not drug addicts. Because only a drug addict knows what it's like to be hooked That's on true. heroin. If you've known anyone who recovered from heroin, they'll tell you methadone was worse than, is worse than heroin. It's like we have people advising a system that have no connection to the system. And sometimes and that's, mm -hmm. that's why we're not getting anywhere on it. Right. And look, again, sometimes this comes back to the money. Their methadone is legal in that the states even force some of the heroin addicts to take methadone. And that's partly because somebody gets paid on methadone. You know, it's the illegal stuff. The drug guys get paid on that nobody makes a... Hey, politicians don't make a profit on that. Whatever they make a profit on, they push. But you know what? Now private prisons are all over the country. Oh, yeah. And they got to fill up those prisons. Mm -hmm. And so a great right. way to do that is the war on drugs. You know what the war on drugs remind me of is the, uh, the Cuban embargo. Like, it's as fruitless as this. Like, we've been doing this for 51 years. It's not about to start working. We're not about to have Cuba go, you know what? You're right. You got us in a bind. We're the only country who behaves this way. And, and for the war on drugs, the, obviously the embargo has no effect at all. And then none. And we're getting a whole new generation of people thinking differently. And in the war on drugs, there's also like, you know, um, you watch any story that any television show does that the current TV did, the Vanguard series did on the Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. And like, that's also going to, there are like 30,000 dead people from mm -hmm. this nonsense. That if that's, it's going to have an effect there too. Forget how it's going to improve our lives. It's going to make. I know again, nobody in America gives a crap about what happens to anybody in Mexico, but it's going to have an effect there too if we ever change this. You know, I love that analogy. I mean, who sits there in in reality and says, if we just give the Cuban embargo one more year, one more year, I think we got them on the ropes. Yeah. Okay, we're ready for the knockout punch. It's the same with the war on drugs. Is there a single person in the country who thinks if we just go one? One more year, we're gonna win the war on drugs. It's so asinine. You know what we're gonna do? Richard, I got this tweet for you. The Young Turks thanks you for your strong stance against the pointless and costly drug war. You've been retweeted on the point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I wanna make my final point of the week, and it's actually on Ron Paul, a guy that we've been discussing throughout the show. Uh, I think he's getting hosed. And it's not because I'm in favor of Ron Paul. There are some things that I agree with him on, whether it's legalizing drug, ending the wars, our civil liberties. Yes, I agree with him on those. But he wants to get rid of Social Security. He wants to get rid of the income tax. He wants to get rid of the Department of Education. I totally disagree with him on all, all of that. And so I'm very concerned about those issues that Ron Paul has. But before, everybody was saying Ron Paul is irrelevant because he's in second or third and he's just a fringe character and he's never gonna make it out, he's never gonna win. Now he's number one in Iowa, number two in New Hampshire. And what do they turn around and say? Oh, winning Iowa doesn't matter. In fact, if Ron Paul wins Iowa, all the pundits are saying it makes Iowa irrelevant. Wait a minute, I thought Iowa was supposed to be the most relevant thing in the world. In fact, Terry Brand said, the governor of Iowa, said if Ron Paul wins in Iowa, in his home state, then who wins doesn't matter. What you gotta look at is who comes in second or third. Wait a minute, when he was second or third, you said it was irrelevant that he was second or third. No, this is absolutely outrageous. Bill O'Reilly and Fox News Channel despise him as well. O'Reilly goes out there and says, I've disqualified him uh, because of his views on Iran. Then he turns around in another program and agrees with Ron Paul's views on Iran, which is that it would be crazy, it would start World War III if we went into Iran. No, the establishment hates this guy. The reason they 
hate him is because he would actually change the system. Now, I think some of it would be for the better and some of it would be for the worse, but he would bring you real change. And that's why the establishment doesn't like him.